Welcome everyone. Uh, it's three o'clock. It's still arriving some participants, but I think that uh, Estelios, please, I will give you the floor to introduce today okay. a little bit the webinar. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the last uh, webinar for before the summer break of the Costa Action Indus. And uh, we have the pleasure today to have Carlos Perez Garcia Panto that's going to talk about dust composition in climate models. I would like to ask you to try to switch off your cameras and mute yourself. And uh, whenever you have some uh, comment or question, just type it in the chat. And in the end of the talk, we're going to moderate these questions and uh, uh, moderate the discussion. Uh, so Sarah, you can introduce Carlos. My pleasure today is to introduce or invite the speaker. Most of you probably will know Carlos. Carlos Perez Garcia Pando is, is based in Barcelona in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I'm glad to say that is the head of, of my research group, that is the Atmospheric Composition Group. And but also he is AXA and ICREA professor. And he was handled in he's managing a long-term chair on San Andreas Storms at BSC, funded by the AXA Research Fund. And also is now uh, the, the responsible of, of uh, an ERC consolidated grant project called it Fragment. And I suppose that today she, he will give us some tips about this project. Also, he's part of the science team of EMIT, that is a NASA mission that we will soon send on a spectrometer to measure the global mineral composition and the soils on the land. And also his research focuses on understanding the physical and chemical processes controlling the atmospheric aerosols and, uh, and evaluating their effects upon climate, ocean, biochemistry, air quality, and health. Then his core area of expertise is the atmospheric mineral dust, but also he's uh, having a lot of experience in developing models that are uh, 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 installed in supercomputers and HPC platforms. And he, he was doing a big round around the world and then moved to the States and he was in several institutes like NOAA, IRI and NSEP. And today he will overview a little bit all the impacts around of dust in climate and maybe doing some focus in the, in the impacts of the dust mineralogy. Then Carlos, the floor is yours. You have 40 minutes, then thanks a lot for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Sara. Uh, uh, I would like first to to uh, to thank the organizers of, of this webinar for inviting me. Uh, I'm more generally the uh, the industry uh, uh, community and uh, particularly those that have been uh, leading and, and promoting this activity, including Sara, Slobodan, Stereos, and others. Uh, I think that the the the, um, the role of Indust is is really important for our community. Uh, by promoting uh, our work, enhancing uh, networking among us. Uh, particularly in these difficult moments of the pandemic, uh, I think these webinars have been really, really great. So um, I really, I really acknowledge all your work and I thank you very much. Uh, so today, as Sarah said, I'm going to, on the stereos, I, I'm going to talk about uh, dust composition. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to uh, focus on, on, on how we're dealing with dust composition in, in climate models. Uh, I'm going to give you a perspective of, of, of the main challenges that we face, uh, but also um, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspectives of, of, of first, you know, what we're doing in terms of, of research, what is the state of the art, uh, where we think we should be going and where things are indeed going. Uh, uh, and uh, also talk about several projects, including uh, the NASA MIT project and the ERC I have the pleasure to, to lead uh, called Fragment. I would like to acknowledge also uh, the list would be too long to list it here name by name, but uh, a bunch of, of colleagues that uh, are um, collaborating in many, in many ways uh, in these activities around uh, dust composition uh, through all these projects. So, um, OK, 
Okay, let me. Okay, so uh, well, this picture uh, is very well known. It's uh, it's a model simulation uh, by a, 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 a model uh, uh, developed at NASA, uh, where uh, you can you can really see you know it's very very obvious the, the importance of dust uh, in the uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, it is uh, probably the most abundant uh, aerosol in mass. Uh, you can see in this picture dust that's depicted in in this kind of uh, uh, reddish orange uh, colors. Uh, you have, of course, many other aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, but you can see that in the northern hemisphere, uh, dust is, is very is very prevalent in terms, in terms of mass. Uh, another thing I like from this uh, image is you can see different species depicted by, by different colors. Uh, uh, for example, as I said, the dust is a bit depicted in, in orange. Um, but in fact, if we would uh, zoom more into, in, into what is dust, uh, currently we're treating dust in moles as, as, as an homogeneous species, as if it was one entity uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, um, uh, properties that are constant uh, in space uh, and time. Uh, well, not, not necessarily uh, all the properties, I'm talking about the composition, because of course we, we describe uh, uh, size in moles. Uh, but if we if we if we zoom into these particles, we can see that the dust is in fact a myriad of minerals that are internally and externally mixed. And today I'm talking I'm going to talk about the importance of this and how we're going to how we're tackling this in, in models and in general. Uh, let me first uh, give you a a a, um, a perspective on the effects of dust uh, in the climate system. Uh, you know, to give a little bit of context, many of you are dust experts, but I think this, this slide is nice, you know, to recap of what, what we're doing, what we do, right? Uh, uh, dust is emitted from arid sources uh, across, uh, across the planet, is transported, uh, is being processed and aged uh, in combination with other components of the atmosphere, so chemicals. In the short term, uh, it's affecting radiation and cloud microphysics, uh, which in turn uh, perturbs dynamics and physics. In turn, it perturbs wind and turbulence, and again, in a feedback loop, that dust emission. This happens. This can happen at relatively short uh, time scales. At longer time scales, uh, all these processes also are, are affecting climate. Uh, in addition, there are other processes mediated through deposition, uh, through ocean fertilization, and uh, by changing uh, the albedo of snow surfaces, which, together with anthropogenic forcing, uh, are affecting climate. And also at longer time scales, you know, these effects on climate feedback upon emission by uh, perturbing changing uh, sources in terms of vegetation, soil humidity, and also cohesion. Uh, we have to add also that uh, all this, uh, you know, we have to add human disturbances uh, to the sources, uh, either, for example, through agriculture and pasture. Uh, we have sources that are you know, agricultural sources or, or perturbed by agriculture. Uh, and we have also areas that are affected by water use and recreation activities that uh, you know, have become dust sources. So this is a little bit, you know, a, a kind of a, a simple but, you know, global picture of what we're facing here, right? Uh, before also to go in, uh, going into, into, uh, into mineralogy, I wanted to highlight, and this links to some of the presentations that have been happening in the last few months, uh, um, um, uh, I would like to highlight other uh, what I consider, or you know, what you know, I think we we, we would we, we could agree in the in the modern community. What are the main challenges uh, that we're facing in representing the dust cycle and its effects? In addition to mineralogy, which I will I will start you know right away after this slide. So of course uh, we have a lot of uncertainty, and this is probably the major uncertainty uh, in the in the emission term in the sources so on on how to specify sources and emissions in models. Uh, this is partly due. Uh, to the fact, for example, that, that uh, we have still a um, limited idea or um, not limited theoretical idea, but you know, how to implement this into models, uh, how to uh, uh, implement you know, the effects of roughness, vegetation, and, and soil moisture, okay? um, and which uh, of course affects emission and its regional, and its regional spatial and uh, temporal variability. Uh, we have poor databases, uh, very, very much extrapolated of soil texture. We have a poor knowledge of the size distribution of the soils, which, you know, makes things a little bit more complex. Uh, also, you know, we have still uh, a lot of uncertainty in the size distribution of the dust emission on how to, 
um, somehow how to uh, how to constrain that in models. There are some discussions in the community around that whether you know size distribution of the emission is constant or can be considered constant or you know depends upon wind and and, and, and other things. Uh, models typically climate models cannot represent and neither regional uh, uh, models uh, cannot really represent properly wind gusts and, and haboobs. Uh, and this is a, a big problem, particularly under a changing climate in which you know convection could could change and therefore the emission that that is related to, to this kind of like sub, sub grid scale events. Uh, there was a very nice presentation by Clay Ryder uh, a few weeks ago on, on course stats. This is another important certainty and has become a, a really a hot topic of research in the community. The position is not that hot in terms of what the position uh, is not that sexy, it seems, but um, but it's a very, very uh, important problem that you know we haven't tackled properly yet. Uh, and it's difficult to tackle because it's at the end of the chain of, 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 of you know, accumulating all, all the errors in emission transport. So, uh, you know, what the position is something that, uh, that, that, that uh, you know, we need a little bit more effort on that. And of course, you know, shape and optical properties are, are key aspects uh, uh, that, that have to be tackled together with mineral composition, as, as I will explain later. And of course, we have still a lot of problems in order to, to represent long-term variability in models, uh, uh, partly due to the problems that I highlighted just in this slide, but there are other uh, additional problems I will not detail now, but you know, are there. So why is dust mineralogy important, right? Uh, you know, we have already a lot, bunch of, of, of uncertainties. Why do we need to add uh, an additional one? Uh, uh, well, um, uh, in, in reality, uh, as I said, the dust is, uh, is composed by a, by a myriad of, of minerals, and uh, we know that the, uh, that the mineral composition of, 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 the, of the arid sources uh, spatially changes. So uh, we don't have a very clear idea on, on how much that changes, because you know, most, of our, um, most of our estimates are based on, on few soil samples across the world. Uh, you know, very soon we will have better estimates of that. Uh, but there's variability in the sources. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we do care about it because uh, the minerals, the, depending on the type of mineral, uh, each mineral has uh, different properties which affect different aspects of the climate differently. Uh, and here in this picture, you can see, you know, how hematite uh, is is the key uh, is a key mineral. Of go hematite and goethite, in fact, you know, iron oxides are key minerals for uh, for uh, uh, direct effects or for radiation. Uh, they strongly absorb uh, on the short wave. But not only we have other minerals in the long wave like calcite and, and quartz that also um, are especially absorbing at those long term uh, uh, at those long waves. We have things like uh, calcite that are important for chemistry, uh, for the pH of the aerosol, uh, for the thermodynamic equilibrium uh, in the in the aerosol water around the particles, but also you know for heterogeneous chemistry reactions. And then of course we have uh, the effect of mineral composition on the perturbation of clouds, so uh, you know acting as, as as cloud condensation nuclei, like in in, in several ways. One is you know by being affected, you know, by heterogeneous reactions, uh, of course, dust becomes more uh, hydrophilic and, you know, prone to to create uh, to be a nuclei for warm clouds. But also, uh, dust is a very efficient ice nuclei, as you know. And uh, you know, uh, recent research has shown that feldspar is a very important uh, uh, mineral for that. Uh, you know, with orders of magnitude more activity than than the other minerals. Finally, iron. Uh, different species of iron uh, and uh, who's, you know, where the importance of those species is the potential solubility they can have once they go to uh, the deposit in the ocean also depend upon mineralogy. So as you can see, there's a variety of processes uh, that are affected by mineralogy, okay? And uh, so uh, currently, as, as you know, our system models neglect uh, these dust mineralogical composition variations. So traditionally, what we have been doing is to, to have an average mineral aerosol. Uh, we have different size bins or modes, and this is what we transport in models. Uh, why this is the case? Uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one is potentially, well, it's a simplification uh, that may be in some cases, uh, you know, good enough, you know, because the uncertainties that, that, that are due to the variations in mineralogy are not strong enough or other uncertainties may be uh, stronger. 
uh, but this is not really well known, okay? And this is why we're doing this kind of, of, of work. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, by introducing new minerals in models, uh, uh, it becomes very expensive computationally. So we have to be very sure that, that, you know, we want to represent, you know, a variety of minerals along with their sizes in models because climate models, uh, uh, they are very, very expensive. We cannot add a more expense, you know, uh, trading off very little, uh, uh, very little accuracy, okay? Uh, so uh, here there are examples of, of different minerals and their properties, elite, hematite, kaolinite, and mormolinite. These are, you know, iron oxides and aluminosilicates. But of course, we have uh, uh, many others like quartz, feldspar, uh, and other aluminosilicates and calcite. Okay. So uh, it has been repeatedly shown. Uh, it has been repeatedly shown in the in the in the literature uh, through uh, laboratory experiments and that um, shortwave forcing uh, uh, should be affected by mineral composition. Uh, this is a, a study by Mos Muller in 2012 showing how the single scattering albedo scales with the, with the content of, of iron oxide from different soils, okay? Uh, here you can see, you know, single scattering albedo going from uh, 0 0.94 to 0 0.98, depending on the amount of, uh, of hematite or iron. Uh, also, long wave forcing, as I said, uh, depends upon the content of calcite and, and quartz in different bands. Uh, this is, you know, an example of the study of DBIG in 2017, uh, uh, you know, that came, comes out from a, a uh, dust dispersion chamber, uh, you know, measuring uh, scattering and absorption and then the mineralogy and, and showing these relationships. They, can, they also show the relationship of iron oxides uh, with, uh, with the absorption and the single scattering albedo. Uh, you know, uh, what about the heterogeneous chemistry on clouds? This is a very, you know, very good example. Uh, here we have, a, you know, a bunch of dust particles, A, B, and C, uh, you know, where B and C uh, are poorly reactive, it's still dust, uh, but only dolomite, uh, which is a, a, a carbonate, is reacting with the, uh, with the, nitric, the nitric acid and, and producing a nitrate salt. So, so this shows, uh, you know, like uh, you know, why it is important to especiate uh, the mineralogy uh, in dust, okay? Uh, also, ice nucleation, uh, mixed phase clouds are, are heavily affected by dust. In particular, uh, you know, this seminal, uh, seminal study of Atkinson show how important is uh, potassium feldspar, you know, is by far the, the, the most active or, you know, the, the most potentially active mineral, uh, you know, compared to all other minerals. And I was, as, as I will explain a little later, this is, uh, this can be extremely important, particularly in the context of climate change uh, due to its potential role in the cloud phase climate feedback, okay? Uh, iron sublithium and mineralogy, there have been a you know, variety of studies. Uh, you know, this is one example by, by, by Zongbo Shi in 2011, but there, were, there have been a bunch of them afterwards, also by Zongbo and other authors, uh, uh, showing the, uh, the relationship of iron mineralogy and, and, and solubility in particular of, of different pools of iron, uh, particularly uh, depending on the size of the iron oxides, you know, from nano iron oxides to micrometric size iron oxides to structural iron and how these different iron species uh, behave in terms of solubility and, you know, have implications in terms of, uh, of its deposition in the ocean. Uh, so what are the causes for dust composition variations in the atmosphere and, of course, in the associated effects? So, uh, uh, you know, I have, I summarized this in three different ways. So, so there are the three different main effects that can explain variations in the mineral dust composition that we could sample in the atmosphere. One, of course, is the variations in the soil surface mineralogy, as we said before. Then there's also an effect of the size sorting. So there's a relationship between mineralogy and size. Um, uh, not only uh, there's a size sorting at emission, because there's a process of some blast or of saltation and some blasting, but also during transport, uh, there's, uh, for example, sedimentation and, and wet scavenging that, you know, is size selective. And also, you know, many of the minerals uh, are also depending on, on size, for example, quartz uh, uh, picks towards larger particle sizes, well, iron oxides uh, tend to pick in the smaller particle sizes, okay? So uh, there's, this, there's this relationship and depending on, on, the, on the lifetime of that, of that air mass and on the history, you know, you may have different compositions 
uh, due to this size effect, okay? And then, of course, in the atmosphere, as I said before, there are chemical transformations during transport. So the properties of the dust particles that, you know, depending also on the mineralogical composition are going to change uh, because they are going to be coated by other, with other substances, uh, et cetera, okay? So these are, you know, the causes, the main causes of, of variations that we can find in the atmosphere. And of course, you know, we need to tackle all of them in moles in order to properly represent the composition uh, in moles, okay? So uh, there are many challenges associated to mineralogy, but, you know, if we have to summarize into, into three key ones, uh, they are, you know, I would say they are not the only ones, but, you know, that the ones that are really, really very specific to mineralogy and, uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, there are other challenges that also would, uh, would benefit mineralogy, but you know they are also independent of mineralogy. For example, you know sedimentation, and you know it's important for mineralogy, but it's not a key challenge of mineralogy. You know it affects uh, you know size basically, and through size it affects mineralogy. So if I have to identify three challenges, this would be the global soil mineral content, uh, the emission of of these minerals from the sources, and then of course uh, in moles, you know how to represent these interactions. Uh, between the, the different minerals and, and, and things like radiation, chemistry, and clouds, okay? Uh, so what is the current status of, of, of the mapping of soil mineralogy? So, you know, like the boundary conditions that we use in models, uh, you know, basically now we're, you know, we're using two different types of maps, you know, based on Clacan and Jornet and some variations of it. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, you know, like this is, rather limited because uh, it is based on, on soil surveys that were designed for agriculture. And, you know, they are massively extrapolated based on, on soil type. Uh, so basically, you know, all this map, you know, that you see here, uh, you know, the global map is, is basically informed by the points that you see here in, this, in these locations here, okay? So there's massive extrapolation, particularly in, in, the, in the arid regions where, you know, we have a, a limited amount of, of measurements. Most of the measurements are in agricultural areas, which do not represent, you know, the natural dust sources, okay? Um, and then, of course, also in these data sets, there's a massive amount of, of assumptions in terms of, you know, on the size of the minerals uh, and, you know, for gap filling of different minerals and, and, and other assumptions, okay? Um, fortunately, uh, and this is something that, uh, uh, that, you know, will probably, you know, help us, uh, you know, change uh, this problem in the near future. Uh, there's a, an ongoing project funded by NASA, which is called EMIT. Uh, the project uh, basically will uh, mount a, a spectrometer in the International Space Station uh, in 2022. It was supposed to happen in 2021, but it was delayed. Uh, due to the, to, to the pandemic, uh, but it will mount a, a hyperspectral imager uh, in the International Space Station by 2022. And what we will obtain uh, is what, what EMIT will do is to use uh, this imaging spectroscopy of that minerals. Uh, 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 so uh, in order, you know, uh, minerals are distinguished by the spectral signature and, and so what this spectrometer will do is to detect these minerals at a resolution of 60 meters across arid sources of the earth. And based on that information, uh, uh, we will produce, it will produce uh, soil abundance maps with a variety of techniques, okay? Um, so uh, this spectrometer covers uh, the, uh, the, the, the visible to short wavelet infrared spectral range from 400 to, to 2,500 nanometers. And uh, you know the, it targets uh, ten key minerals uh, in in this kind of uh, in this kind of window. One of the limitations will be it will not be able to sample uh, feldspar and quartz because uh, uh, the the spectral signatures are beyond the the window of the of the instrument. But there are other uh, observations that are being considered uh, uh, that are available um, uh, to cover that gap. Uh, to be combined uh, together with uh, with the emit uh, with the emit data. Okay, um, I will skip this. I just wanted to uh, to show you you know an example in the Salton Sea on on what this could mean in terms of of uh, the difference that you don't that what what will happen when this data is available. Here on the left, you can see uh, you know like in a this is in the U.S. a region a, a region across you know around the Salton Sea, which is here. 
And this is uh, uh, the um, a map of clay minerals uh, based on the current soil file products, okay? And this is a map, a uh, demonstration map based on imaging spectroscopy from, from an airplane, you know, with an instrument that is very similar to what we will have uh, from space, uh, you know, with Emmet. Uh, and showing, you know, like, uh, of course, you know, like the, uh, the, the, the complexity and the variety of, of mineral abundances of clay minerals, of course. Um, and, and this is kind of the, the richness of this data set. It will be able to uh, to have estimates, uh, you know, very detailed estimates on the on the content of different iron species, uh, even you know some information on, on the size of these minerals. So this this can be very very powerful. Of course, there are also inherent uh, intrinsic limitations associated to um, to this type of information uh, that we are currently tackle uh, tackling through both Emmet and, and 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 other projects. But the amount of measurements that will be available is unprecedented, and uh, it, this will very likely change uh, the research in our domain. Okay, these are the areas that will be covered by Emmet. Uh, you need to know that Emmet is a one, in principle, is a one-year mission, um, uh, although it may, you know, last longer. Uh, it's a demonstrate. It's a kind of demonstration project very targeted to mineral dust. So uh, of course, you, you know, the, the, the spectra that, that will be um, uh, obtained, it, it, it will have other types of uses, but the project Emmet is tailoring uh, dust sources and its mineralogy. So this, I think this is a great, uh, great thing for us. And it will target this area during one year. Uh, we need to know also that uh, this this will be a starting uh, a starting thing because uh, NASA has recently approved. Uh, you know, after the Decal survey has 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 approved. You know, has uh, you know, it, it, it's very likely that you know from 2027 there will be um, a recurrent observations from spectrometers in space. You know, with uh, with a uh, with a frequency of of one measurement uh, every 15 days, you know, so regular spectroscopic measurements of this kind will be available in about uh, five, six, seven years from now. So uh, EMIT represents like a starting point for the dust community, but you know, this type of data will become more and more frequent in the near future. Uh, and I think this creates uh, additional opportunities, okay? So this is a description of the products that will be available. I will not go into, into details, but you know, basically there will be different levels of data uh, going from very high resolution and, and, and more raw data to lower resolution integrated aggregated data prepared to be used in, uh, in models. And of course, there will be also uh, uh, products derived directly from models, from our system models uh, after running simulations of the dust cycle uh, with this kind of maps and um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to the next uh, challenge, which is related, to, you know, so this was one challenge, which is, okay, what do we do with, uh, to constrain the boundary condition in models, okay, so this is creating, uh, you know, like a you know, possibility in the future to improve that aspect uh, dramatically, but, you know, there are many additional challenges, and one is that, um, you know, now uh, the information that we have in mineralogy is based on um, um, on uh, on estimates uh, of the soil, you know, uh, in where you know the samples are. When when samples are analyzed in the lab, they are broken. You know, the, the, the technique that is typically used is wet sieving. So all the information on mineralogy that we have is wet sieved. Uh, in other words, you know, the aggregates are broken into fundamental components, and we have the mineralogy in two particle sizes, clay and silt, uh, you know, with not very much resolution, just two, two particle sizes. And uh, of course, this, create, this has created some challenges in order to how to represent that in models. You know, if we have information that is wet sieved, uh, how do we emit those minerals then in models, uh, you know, to represent the natural process of emission, okay? Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, you can have a you know, mineral composition in the soil, but then there's gonna be a, an important difference of the mineral composition of the soil and the emitted dust that is, you know, to the most part, you know, the, 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 the process that most explains uh, uh, emission uh, across arid regions is this saltation and some blasting. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, there's a size sorting, there's a breaking of the aggregates of the natural soil. Um, so, you know, representing physically 
this process together with information uh, on the soil, on the size the distributed uh, minerals, you know, represents a, a, a big challenge, okay? Um, so in fact, we already have uh, issues, you know, to represent emission, even if we disregard, you know, the dimension of mineralogy, just, you know, to represent the bulk uh, emitted dust and its size distribution, we, you know, we still have an incomplete understanding of, of the physics. Uh, there are not too many measurements available, although there are some. Uh, there, there are campaigns that have been done, you know, in the in the last 20, 30 years, but there are not not uh, you know so many. Uh, and there's you know still some contradictions between theories and uh, and, and field observations and internal experiments, etc. Okay, and then of course we we you know we you know, we also have you know a lack um, of um, of uh, um, quality data sets on on the soil texture of the soil you know at global scale that could be used in in models okay uh, for the emitted PSD, I'm not going to go into details, but there are different uh, theoretical frameworks. Uh, you know, there are more than this that I show here, but these are representative of, of or the most popular or the most commonly used, or, um, or you know, in, in other words, the you know ones that represent the landscape of uh, emission theories. Uh, the one the the, the emission uh, the, the yeah the uh, to represent the emitted PSD in this case. Uh, the one of Alfaro, dust production model, which, uh, you know, basically the concept is that uh, the emitted size distribution depends on, on the bonding energy of the aggregates and uh, it predicts that uh, the size distribution depends on, on, the, on the wind uh, because, you, you know, it also postulates that the, that the kinetic energy of the saltator scales with the wind, okay? Uh, then the show model, which is, you know, the emitted PSD is a weight average uh, between the disturbed and disturbed soil. Uh, it also depends on, on on wind, although you know, like it could be, it could be used with that without that dependence. But you know, like uh, it, it 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 depends on on, on wind based on on wind tolerance experiments. Um, and then you know, finally the uh, the the model of Jasper Koch, uh, real fragmentation theory, which uh, kind of assumes and and states or postulates that the emitted size distribution is relatively invariant uh, across certain ranges of the size distribution, which makes things easier for models. And uh, is based on a similarity between the, the, uh, the fragmentation of brittle materials, the physics of brittle materials, and the fragmentation of aggregates of dust during dust emission, okay? Um, so uh, now, okay, now if we add the dimension of mineralogy, uh, the picture even becomes more complex. Um, so first of all, we don't only have to care about, you know, the emitted size distribution uh, of the bulk dust, uh, but, you know, also like in terms of theory and, and how to link properties, we have to care about the relationship and, you know, how to project the mineralogy of the soil into uh, the emitted size distribution of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the minerals, okay? Uh, with all these complexities on the wet sieving. Also, we need to know, for example, uh, um, um, you know, these minerals, if they are internally or externally mixed, this makes big difference, for example, in the optics. So if we have iron oxides that are internally mixed or externally mixed, you're gonna have a big difference in, their, uh, in how they absorb uh, radiation, okay? Uh, so, you know, a bunch of, of, of complexities that, you know, first, you know, we would like to understand them and second, we would like to, to know how to simplify them in order that, that they are tractable in models, okay? Carlos, 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm going to just uh, go through, uh, through this a little bit, you know, fast, but, uh, uh, you know, this is an example of the mixing state of minerals. Here you have an aluminosilicate particle of 10, 10 microns. So you can see it here an, an aggregate of uh, aluminosilicates. Uh, and then, you know, a small inclusion of iron oxide here, okay? And then here, this is an, an, a, a, a particle, an iron oxide particle, which is externally mixed, which is alone, of two microns, okay? So these are typically, you know, things that, that, we, that we can see in dust and, you know, we should be able to be able to, to kind of represent in an effective way or in a simplified way, these kind of uh, uh, things in, into the models. So as I said, the current state of the art for, uh, for uh, mineralogy in, in models are the two data sets. The data set of Clacan also complemented by, by a study in 2012 by, by Slobodan, by, by, by Nico, 
uh, in which he complemented some of the of the uh, of the soil types, but also a more recent data set of of Jurnet, Okay, uh, the current state of the art for mineralogy for the emitted PSD. Uh, basically, only uh, bureau fragmentation theory has been used for mineralogy. Uh, basically, because it's uh, it's quite simple to use and it's quite uh, auspicious for that. Because bureau fragmentation theory, although I will not go into details, it depends upon the uh, disturbed soil. So uh, basically it predicts the emitted size distribution uh, based on a, uh, a disturbed soil PSD. So this is a species for mineralogy because mineralogy, the kind of information that we have today is dispersed soil PSD, okay? Uh, for other frameworks, uh, for example, some need you know, the dry size distribution, which perhaps could be estimated from but you know, not, not there hasn't been any work done uh, with those with those theoretical uh, frameworks. Only with real fragmentation theory, and there's a bunch of works that have used it and applied it and even extended. Okay, uh, I will not go into details, but this is more or less how it works. You know, like even a, a, a disturbed soil, uh, we can predict the emitted size distribution of minerals. Um, uh, so. Uh, you know, bureau fragmentation uh, predicts a change with respect to the disturbed soil. So we have coarser particles than in the disturbed soil. And also we have the uh, aluminosilicates and other minerals that are in the uh, clay sizes of the disturbed soil that are now in the emitted uh, silt sizes of the dust, okay? And this is the fractional emitted size distribution of the different minerals uh, in the wet sieve soil or disturbed soil. And this is in the emitted dust. And, and you see that like the difference both in the bulk size distribution and also in the uh, relative fractions of the minerals per size, okay? Um, not, going to, not going into details, we have also extended uh, this framework uh, by, um, you know, additionally uh, changing uh, and fitting, you know, soil mineral distribution, specific distributions in the soil. Uh, you know, and we have also shown uh, through um, uh, simulations uh, that these frameworks, you know, improve uh, the PSD of the transported minerals when we compare with observations away from the sources, okay? And there are some works uh, showing that and, you know, some others in preparation in that sense, okay? Uh, but uh, when we look at bulk mineralogy, so things that do not depend on size, so, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, ratios of elite to uh, kaolinite or you know, things that are not size dependent or, or, you know, that, you know, in which, you know, really the important aspect is um, the combination or the contribution of the different sources to, uh, to, to the dust and not its size distribution at emission. Uh, we see that the model doesn't behave that well, which points towards the fact that we need better uh, constraints of the, of the soil, okay? So somehow we have some approaches that can be improved for the emitted size distribution. They are not perfect, but, and they can be improved, but at least we have some approach. And we have something that doesn't work very well for as a boundary condition. I'm going to move forward, fast forward uh, just a, a moment uh, onto the optical properties and the, and the direct relative effect. Of course, um, we have additional uncertainties there. Uh, just as a summary, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, there's, you know, relatively high uncertainty in the, in the, uh, in the direct relative effect. And, you know, most of this uh, uncertainty, well, there are two, there are two, there, there are two main uncertainties. One is the mineral composition, and the other one probably is the uh, the lack of of coarse particles in in models. So, uh, in short, uh, you know, for uh, for more scattering or more absorbing dust, we have you know quite a lot of difference in the on the top of the atmosphere forcing and also the surface. But you know, here I'm showing just the the top of the atmosphere forcing. Um, uh, this not only changes like the, uh, the global relative forcing or the relative effect, but also changes the precipitation patterns, for example, in regions like the Sahel, okay? And this is why in terms of, you know, the climate effect, not only for, and perhaps more importantly for, um, for the adjustment of precipitation at regional scales is so important to have uh, the mineralogy well constrained, okay? Um, there's uh, currently, you know, the uncertainty to the current estimates of soil mineralogy have been studied recently in a paper in 2021 
in 2021 by, by Long Lei Li. Uh, and, uh, and basically, you know, considering the current uncertainties in soil mineralogy, in other words, if we get uh, Clacan and Jornet and we perturb uh, across, we perturb uh, those mineral soil mineralogies across uh, the known uncertainties for each soil type, uh, we obtain an uncertainty in the, in the, in the global net uh, top of the atmosphere forcing between 0.23 minus 0 0.23 to 0 0.35, which is quite huge, okay? Um, you know, this is not the real uncertainty uh, due to dust. This is the uncertainty that we have due to the current uncertainty of soil mineralogy when we include soil mineralogy models, okay? It's a little bit different. You know, I, I, I cannot go into the details, but uh, if you are interested in this, you know, just look into this paper in ACP, okay? And, you know, another important thing is that 95% of this range in the uncertainty of this range is related to the abundance of iron oxide. So if, uh, you know, for radiation, we need to constrain iron oxides, you know, this is already known, but here it is well quantified. Um, just some notes on the, on the modeling of isonucleating particles. Uh, these are, uh, you know, four different approximations, modeling approximations on how to represent uh, isonucleating uh, ice, um, ice nuclei. And uh, you know this uh, parameterization of Mayer's you know, was very much used in the past, and uh, well, it's still used in many moles in 1992. Does not depend on aerosol. Uh, here, you know, in the mod, we start having a dependency on the coarse fraction of of of, um, of aerosols. So this includes dust and you know marine aerosols. Uh, at the same in in Niemand. And then uh, in Bergan and Prado, based on the study of Atkinson et al., they already include dependencies on feldspar and also on marine aerosols. But uh, we, you know, slowly uh, the estimates and the comparison with observations have been improving by introducing mineralogy in the models. But you know, we're very still very far away into uh, properly representing that. Uh, there's still a, a lot of uncertainties. Okay, and uh, I. I think uh, this is one of the key, you know, like, uh, of course, um, um, uh, direct effects are, are really important. Uh, iron oxides, uh, you know, is the key, as we said, uh, we still have to constrain that. But I think that, that uh, you know, uh, in fact, there's a very recent paper by, by Benjamin Moray, like, uh, it's an opinion paper in ACP, showing how important it can be to constrain the IMP. And, you know, if we have to constrain IMP, uh, you know, we have to think about dust among others, but dust is a very important one. And this is due to the cloud phase, the uh, climate feedback, um, uh, which is basically, you know, what happens to clouds uh, as the climate warms. And models, uh, both in CMIP5 and CMIP6, have a lot of uncertainty in this case, and some, some models tend to, to say that, you know, the clouds dampen warming, and others that, you know, uh, uh, clouds amplify warming. You know, and part of this uncertainty, uh, it is due to how we are dealing uh, with IMP in moles, okay? So uh, I will not go into details again, but understanding dust, its size result first part content, and, you know, the changes in emissions that could happen, uh, you know, as the climate warms, uh, is, is really key to, to constrain this important feedback, okay? And maybe even more important than the direct relative effect in terms of, you know, it's, um, its contribution to, to climate change, okay? So yet another, you know, important aspect on why we need to tackle this. I will finally end this by saying that, you know, many of these aspects of many of the challenges that I have highlighted here are being tackled in, in the project that I'm, I'm leading, which is an ERC project. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are working in, in several fronts. One is on the emission of minerals, and for that we're, you know, we're trying to improve theory uh, through um, field campaigns and, uh, you know, gathering new data from field campaigns and and uh, and new laboratory analysis. Uh, we're also contributing, uh, you know, like to support Emmet uh, with uh, spectroscopy measurements in our field campaigns, and you know. Uh, linking, you know, like the physical samples and, you know, physically uh, laboratory uh, analyzed samples with the spectroscopy, and this is ongoing work. And of course, you also in the modeling part, you know, we're supporting in terms of uh, on studying, you know, from a modeling point of view, how these improvements in the soil maps and the emitted size distributions uh, will play out uh, for uh, the different processes that are affected by mineralogy. Um, so we have done uh, one big campaign in 2019, 
in Morocco. We were supposed to do one in 2020 in, in, in the US and we were not able to do so due to COVID. We also had to do one in, in, in Iceland in 2020, we couldn't. Um, so this is the new plan. Uh, we will have you know, a reduced campaign in the US in 2022. This summer, we have everything prepared to go to Iceland. So our instruments are now in Rotterdam and will soon arrive in Reykjavik. So we will be measuring a high latitude uh, dust uh, in the same way that we measured you know, mid latitude dust in Morocco. And then in 2022, in combination with other projects, uh, we will go again to Morocco to another location. Okay. Um, so I will not go into details. You know, we're measuring very much detail, the soil, the emitted dust, the meteorology, uh, the spectroscopy, uh, the saltation, uh, you know, it's quite unprecedented in terms of the amount of instrumentation that we have for a dust emission field campaign. We're also measuring, you know, optical properties and we're trying to, to make sense of everything together uh, and how this play out, you know, in terms of optical properties, size distribution, mineralogy, and its relationship with the parent soil. Uh, you know, some, you know, basic results, you know, we're currently, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on, uh, on, on, on data analysis mode, but some results are that, uh, you know, uh, PSD um, can depend on the type of episode. And uh, we see coarser PSDs, for example, uh, when we have Habub events. Uh, uh, mineralogy, we can see, you know, clear size dependence, which is, you know, consistent with some of the hypotheses that we formulated for, for the project. Um, uh, in terms of shape, we cannot see uh, much relationship of shape uh, with size and uh, neither uh, on mineralogy, of course, there's some variations, but, um, you know, on, on average, uh, you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be an important shape dependence with size. And then in optical properties, we really see distinct optical properties depending on the type of event, uh, which is mediated by, of course, by the size distribution and uh, by the mineralogy. Okay. Uh, I will just finish uh, with some key points, uh, you know, or, or, or things that I consider important. Um, so uh, the global imaging spectroscopy, I think, and, you know, like many of us believe it will drastically improve our knowledge of the earth surface mineral dust source, uh, source composition. It will create a lot of opportunities for our field of research and, you know, associated fields of research. But many challenges remain, uh, you know, uh, we still don't know clearly on how to use these new data sets uh, properly in models and how to deal with some of its intrinsic limitations. I could not go into details of this, but this is something that we're working on. Uh, we have to rethink uh, the methods on, on how to constrain the immediate mineral size distributions. Um, uh, believe it or not, the optical constants of the individual minerals that come from papers from the, from the 70s, 80s and 90s are still very uncertain and we need new efforts. Although, you know, these are not very sexy measurements, uh, you know, like we're pushing for that to happen. Hopefully it will happen soon in the US, but we still not clear, but there's not a clear funding for that. But this is particularly problematic for iron oxides. We have a lot of uncertainty on what are, what is the optical, I mean, what is the index of refraction of, of hematite and goethite? Uh, you know, still a lot of uncertainty on that. Um, of course, we need to combine, you know, smartly the optical property, you know, for to calculate the optical properties, you know, shape, uh, the fact that we have coarse particles, composition, and internal mixing. Uh, we lack widespread measurements for evaluation, uh, but not only for minerals, but also um, uh, for IMP, for example. And 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 if you look at the, at Benjamin Morey's paper in ACP, uh, there's a clear case for that. Uh, and also we need to think on, you know, and finally end up with uh, responding to a question, what is the mineral representation of mineralogy that we need for climate models? Because we don't want to spend too many resources. We just need to spend as much as we need. Okay. So yeah, I will, I will stop here. Um, and I hope we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Um... There are some questions in the chat. Uh, Estelius, I don't know if you can. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of questions, but we will start uh, uh, from the first one from Zong Posi, asking if a meat can measure magnetite and if it covers high latitudes. And also, well, we can continue afterwards, you can answer this one. 
So if I make measure magnetized and if it covers the high lag field. Uh, it is not targeting, it is not targeting uh, magnetite uh, as one of the key minerals and is not measuring high latitude sources. But uh, as I said before, um, um, it's it basically is not targeting high latitude sources because because of the uh, trajectory of the ISS. Okay, it's not it's not it, it does it cannot cover. But uh, not only there will be um, near future measurements, uh, you know, like based on uh, you know based on satellite, not the ISS. But you know, even now, uh, you know, there are other missions ongoing, like NMAP, which is a German mission, and, and Prisma, which is Italian mission. Uh, that are you know providing you know already gathering um, spectra uh, at the same in the same spectral range. These projects are not specifically targeting dust and you know mineralogy for dust applications. You know the, the good thing about Emmit is that it targets mineralogy, and we're targeting um, you know how to deal with that kind of information for dust applications. Okay, but uh, definitely there will be more data that will be able to, we will be able to process that data with the methods that are being um, uh, uh, somehow developed within Emmit. Okay. I think that the, still the next question of Jumbo is about the BSD measurements during the campaign. I think that is already answered because the answer is yes. Is yes, a fragment is devoted to, to provide some observations of BSD of minerals, right, Carlos? I, I, I'm not reading the question, so if you can really. Uh... No, I, I think that you are already answered this question that is related to the me measurements of PSD of minerals during the your ERC grant. And the yes, yes. So we are, yeah, we are, we are, so we have, uh, you know, we have PSD measurements, so we have online measurements, so, you know, with uh, optical particle counters at different heights. Uh, we have, uh, you know, like also uh, we are collecting uh, samples by size, you know, for example, with uh, cascade impactors with Moody's. We're collecting, you know, with, um, you know, free wing impactors, uh, you know, in, in targets, you know, to do the, the, um, uh, the single particle analysis. Uh, yeah, so we have size distribution and we have mineralogy by size uh, in a range of, you know, the first 20 to 30 microns. I think okay. it's here. Thanks. Uh, now, Nicholas uh, Marsden uh, is asking if we overlook mixed particles and poorly crystalline material uh, that does not fit the properties of the pure mineral phases, and if models would benefit from a classification scheme that is less quantum and more continuous. So, so can you repeat the first part yes. of the question? If we overlook mixed particles and poorly crystalline material that doesn't fit the properties of the pure mineral phases. Yeah, I mean, of, of course. Uh, I mean, depending on the on the methods, uh, you know, we have uncertainties uh, on, on the different mineral phases. And in, in our case, for example, we are starting to compare in very much detail uh, results, you know, derived from XRD and uh, single particle analysis. And, you know, we're trying to, to make sense of, of, of those comparisons. Uh, as you know, you know, XRD uh, measurements, they have their inherent uncertainties, uh, particularly, you know, for low crystalline uh, minerals. So, um, yeah. Um, And the second part of the question is, do models benefit from a particle classification scheme that is less quantum and more continuum? Uh, so if you mean by that, if, if you have, if you, it is better, uh, the, um, it is better a model than a size, than a beam scheme. That's what you refer to. Exactly, yeah. So rather than being obsessed with pure end member of mineral phases, that we have some kind of chemical signature that is, is, is more continuum. Well, I mean, you know, the, the problem of, uh, you know, if uh, the, the, I mean, and this goes beyond, uh, this goes beyond um, a mineralogy. Uh, you know, some others, you know, may have another opinion, but, um, you know, it is problematic to, to describe dust with modes. 
particularly, you know, I mean, if you don't have enough modes, and typically, you know, the reason for having modes is to have, uh, you know, just a reduced amount of modes, where you could describe not only that, but, you know, all the other aerosols and to do the microphysics. And uh, so, for example, in many models, not all, but in many models, we have two modes for that, you know, accumulation and cores. And it is, you know, definitely not enough to represent the size distribution of dust, uh, you know, from emission to deposition. Uh, basically, because, uh, for example, we cannot uh, we cannot properly tackle the, the core size, which you know, which is important. You know, cores. When I say cores, is you know, super cores as well. You know, above ten microns, which could be important. And also, the tail of the modes, uh, it you know, it does not adapt, so it's one entity, so it doesn't properly. Uh, um, it doesn't properly represent, you know, the change in the size distribution along transport, unless, again, unless you include more modes. So, for example, if you include four modes, you know, it may it may work better. So, you know, like for representing dust, uh, you know, it is better to have, in my opinion, uh, to have, uh, you know, a size bin uh, model. But of course, I understand that this is not possible in the context of many climate models with microphysics. Okay, uh, another question has to do with if you can briefly describe the inversion algorithm from emit measurements to dust composition. So maybe if you can really briefly describe it, huh. <laughs> or okay. if you point out some. Okay. Um, uh, well, um, it is it is very complicated, very complicated, and you know, like in many aspects, way beyond my expertise. Uh, so, um, but basically, there. Are, in, in fact, you know, I didn't mention that. Um, so, uh, emit, and this is something that BI of emit, uh, you know, would like to to say is it's a cost cap mission, and uh, you know, there's a you know a clear plan, and uh, you know, we cannot do research on on some of the aspects because they are not funded. So it's very operational, right? And for example, the uh, the mineralogy and the, the mineralogy is going to be based on on tetracorder, which is a kind of a matching algorithm. What it does is, you know, it basically compares the spectral signatures that you know that you obtain with libraries of minerals and tries to match. And based on that matching, it identifies the different minerals in the scene, so in the in the pixel. And that, based on the spectral uh, the spectral abundance. It creates, you know, the you know the mineral abundances. You know, it it, it like it, it uses that as a proxy of, of uh, mineral abundance. Okay, this is you know a quite simple approximation, but there are other kind of models that are being considered uh, in the context of fragment because you know some of the uh, some of the uh, co investigators in Emit are are also co investigators in fragment, and there we are tackling uh, you know a little bit more complex models in order to in the future not for the operational emit for but for the future to have uh, perhaps better estimates of the mineral composition based on the reflection spectra we have time for a last question and and um, i don't know Stelius, uh, you can pick one <laughs> because there are more we will send you all the questions Carlos, sure. if you send me all the questions i will i will try to respond all of them Sure. Because I am afraid that we don't have enough time for all of them. Then, uh, Stelio, should you just choose? Okay. Uh, question from Claire Ryder. Can you go into some more detail on your figure with stats on how optical properties change for the driving meteorology of the dust event? I didn't get so, it. Sorry, again. Sorry. Uh, if you can provide some more details on uh, how optical properties change. Uh, for the driving meteorology of the dust event, you had the uh, figure. Um, really, uh, Claire, can you can you can you talk to me? I mean, I don't get the question. I yeah, if I don't if, can you hear me? It was yes. your results from Morocco. Yes. I think near the end of your slides. Yes. So, yes. Yes. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom center, I think. Here. Uh, bottom center, I think. Here? Here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have, uh, you know, we have different types of, of events, you know, uh, you know, like we have a mission that depends on, um, so we have, you know, depending on the event, we have slightly different uh, size distribution at the mission. 
Uh, and uh, also, you know, uh, this is what we are looking at now more closely. You know, we have a clear dependency on the particle size, you know, like in our optical properties, what we're measuring, most of the campaign we were measuring below PM 2.5 with an ethylometer and ethylometer. So we have, um, we have uh, absorption with a polar ethylometer, sorry. Uh, we have absorption and scattering at multiple wavelengths. And, um, and so we can, we can see that, you know, there's a clear uh, uh, correlation of, you know, effective radius uh, below PM 2.5 and uh, the intrinsic optical properties that we obtain, you know, from the nephilometer and ethylometer. Uh, but also, you know, there are additional dependencies on, on myology that we're exploring, although it is difficult because uh, to, to see because um, our frequency in the measurements of myology are not that high, uh, you know, because for, in order to do the myological analysis, we need to accumulate, you know, uh, quite a lot of, well, quite a lot of mass. Or you know, for the single particle analysis, you know, the targets you know would be saturated, and so we only have like uh, you know instantaneous measurements that you know we then you know put together. But you know, it is hard to see the variability in the optical properties due to myology, But that's what we're exploring now. But clearly, and the size, it's uh, it's very clear. Thank okay. you, Carlos. Uh, okay. Thanks, thanks a lot for all the material that you prepared. I okay, think that's yes, we don't have time for uh, all the questions, but uh, Carlos, you will get them and you can try to answer to sure. of course. Yeah, a couple of them quite interesting, Carlos. We will pass to you, no yeah. worries. But it's four o'clock, we are like a strict in time. Thanks again uh, for, for your time and for the talk because it's the, the last talk of before the summer break. Then, uh, as Estelius mentioned at the beginning of, of the session, uh, Carlos, I need to share my screen a little. Then can you... Uh, I'm sharing the screen. No, I have to. Then you can stop sharing, please. Yeah, because I want to remind the participants that the, the Carlos uh, webinar, but also the rest of the webinars are available in the website here in the media room. You have a section called webinars and here you can get all recorded webinars since the first one that was the, the Nice, the Slovan Nikovic and also the slides. OK, then because still we don't have confirmed the first speaker of the autumn season, Please take also a look to the event section in the industry events, and here you will see the confirmations at, uh, very soon. But uh, I'm afraid that still we have pending the confirmation of all, one of the speakers. Then, as soon as we will get the confirmation, uh, the inscription will be ready in the website. Okay. And with it, uh, just I want to. Uh, wish a great summer to all of you yeah. and I hope to see you after. Sarah, Sarah, let, Sarah may, I, may I say my one last sentence and uh, because I think it's, it, it's important. Uh, yeah. sorry, just, you know, there's a question here which I think it's uh, very, very nice, which is the complexity. And do we need to go so complex? Are we doing things very complex? Probably yes, but we need to understand that complexity in order to simplify it, because we don't know how much complex we need to go. That would be my answer. Okay, yes, that's it. And probably this works for many other questions yeah. in the life. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Carlos. Uh, again, if you want to contact directly Carlos, uh, I am pretty sure that he will welcome all your emails. Then uh, be patient, he will answer you, but maybe after the summer break. And uh, yeah, I hope that you enjoyed these two months without webinars, and then we, we, we will come back with more energy for, for the autumn. Then bye. To Thank all you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.